Today, we have a very special invest talk. They salute to Steve Peasley. This is Invest Talk, independent thinking, shared success. Good afternoon, fellow investors, and welcome back to Invest Talk. This is our Monday, June 3rd, 2024 edition of Invest Talk. I am Justin Klein. And today we have a very special show. Uh, I am sad to announce that uh, just a few days ago, our good friend, Steve Peasley, passed away. After about a year and a half long battle with pancreatic cancer, uh, he passed peacefully in his home, surrounded by his wife, Suzanne, and, and many loved ones. The journey was hard. And we hope that uh, that he is at peace. This was a tough time for for everyone, and I know uh, we had many prayers from our listeners uh, in hopes that he would recover and get better and get back on air. And um, unfortunately, he was not able to do that. You know, I've known Steve for about twenty five years. Uh, we, he grew up in San Diego. He was poor, grew up poor. Uh, he was always afraid of, uh, ever being poor again. And he was naturally conservative because of that. And he told us many stories, uh, about his childhood days. I remember those, uh, and you know, I met him, uh, when I was in high school. And a little backstory on how it came to be part of this sh wonderful show, this wonderful um, company that we ran together for over two decades. He was a he was a client of my grandfather uh, back in the '90s, and my grandfather was my first mentor. Steve was my second mentor, and. When our, our other founder, Lyle Pavlis, passed away in 2000, Steve uh, ended up buying the other half of the company and started on the journey to do what he loved to do, which is investing. He, his early years, he was uh, in insurance and he learned a lot uh, during that time. And we're going to go over some calls, play some calls of Steve um, a little bit later, but and one of them is on insurance. So he had a strong background there. And he was, uh, he was a man who told it like it was. He didn't beat around the bush. He hammered on the importance of honesty, integrity in business. He was an avid reader. He was very logical. Not that emotion, not that emotional, but he was very caring. He cared a lot about other people and um, he loved he loved doing the show and helping people. Even when he was sick last year, gave him life and purpose to, to get back on air. And we're thankful for all the time we had with him. He loved so much about life, reading, telling dad jokes, most of all teaching. And he truly loved his devoted wife, Suzanne, who stood by him through thick and thin, especially during these hard times. So. This hour is going to be dedicated to him. We're going to play some calls that he took throughout the years that really gives a sense of who he was and the sage wisdom that he dispensed every day on Best Talk. 
So this hour format will be a little bit different. We'll be taking some of your calls as well. If you want to call in uh, a little later to maybe tell your story of how Steve touched you. I know many of you met him in person, met him at conferences in person, maybe uh, even sat down with him in office at some point. So if there's anything that you want to say, don't hesitate to reach out. Now, with that said, I'll talk about market performance here in a little bit. I'll run down, uh, you know, the format for the rest of the hour. But let's kick it off. And we'll play one of Steve's, a call from, from Steve and uh, a topic that he truly knew the most about more than anybody I know and was honest. And that was life insurance, just insurance in general. Like I said, he had decades of experience. He started off out of college in insurance. He was in various aspects of the insurance business from underwriting to investment side to uh, claims. And in fact, that's where he actually retired early in his forties and he ran his own claims company. Um, so he knew a lot about insurance and here is a call uh, where he addressed this question. Yes. Hi. I have a question. I have a uh, life insurance policy and I'm 65 years old. The policy is for thinking about my kid's future when I'm gone to leave it to them. It's a $200,000 policy and I'm paying 206 a month because I know it's a little high because of my health issues, but I was wondering what you thought of uh, this investment. Thank you very much. Okay, we've talked about life insurance before, and I have a background in insurance. That's why I started with. I have no problem with people buying a term life policy for a specific length of time for a specific purpose. Most of the time, I'm talking to younger people who should have life insurance because they're married, they have a couple of kids, and if the, one of the breadwinner dies suddenly, that income's got to be replaced for a while. You know, so that's a really good reason to have life insurance. If you're older and you want to just leave money to your children, your grandchildren or whatever, and you're using life insurance to do that, that's a reason to have life insurance. I just don't think it's a great reason to have life insurance. And I'm hoping it's a term life policy that you have, $206 a month. I, I need that, a lot more information from you. Can you afford $206 a month? Is it easy to pay? Is it a term life, whole life, universal life? What kind of policy is it? Um, is a, it's a premium flat or is it going to rise as you get older? Because what happens if you're on a fixed income and you get older and old, older and the premium keeps going up every year, pretty soon you're going to cancel it because you can't afford it anymore. And then, of course, the next year you'll die. And you paid all this premium and got nothing for it. So there's... I, there's so much more information I need before I can answer your question. Again, buying life insurance for a purpose is a good idea. But a lot of people buy it because someone sold it to them. They don't have a good reason to own it. The broker who sold it to you has a good reason for you to own it. So he can make a big commission. That's his reason. Okay. They're not all that way, but you know what I mean. So you got to have a reason for life insurance. And life insurance to me is you buy term life and invest the rest. Because whole life, universal life, they try to talk you into a higher premium so you can be an investment and you can make a lot more money. Well, it just costs a lot more money too. The fees are expensive. And then, then they talk you, well, then you, don't, you can borrow your own money later on down the road. Therefore, you don't have to pay. That's a rotten idea. So there's, so there's a lot more questions I need to so that was a, a great question uh, that showed really Steve's prowess within the insurance space. Like I said, he uh, worked in that industry for so long. So we knew the ins and outs and, and what it was good for and what it wasn't good for. And so, ma so many times he uh, avoided uh, 
insurance because he knew that you know insurance is is simple if you make it simple but too many people make it complex especially those that are selling it because they want a big commission and that was one of the less or first lessons he taught me uh was they stay away from universal whole life variable annuities indexed annuities things like that uh and the simple products are the ones that are for a purpose like he said and I thought that was a, a great one to play that can can always help everyone because you are going to come across an insurance salesman at some point and you need to be armed with knowledge to avoid the products that don't fit your need. Now we'll touch briefly on today's market activity and then play more Steve's questions and answers here on Invest Talk. The big day is coming up fast. Click the link in this video to register for the new InvestTalk Wealth Webinar. It's all happening online Tuesday, June 11th at 1 p.m. Pacific time. You are invited to join KPP Financial's InvestTalk hosts, Justin Klein and Luke Guerrero, as they reveal the secrets of quality investing. Learn why it's essential to look beyond high dividend yield so you can build a resilient and profitable portfolio. In today's volatile market, quality investing is the key to long-term success. Justin and Luke will provide insights and strategies to help you make informed investment decisions. Reserve your spot now. Click the link in this video to register for the new InvestTalk Wealth Webinar. Now let's take a look at the market today. It was a decidedly mixed day overall. You had large cap growth. That was actually up. You had the AMC GameStop uh, surge once again, but they did fade through most of the day. And the big economic news was around the factory activity, U.S. factory ISM report that came in at 48.7 down from 49.2 in April. So two consecutive months in in negative territory remember and on the ism anything below 50 is shrinking anything above 50 is growth so two consecutive months below 50 means that the manufacturing sector is in decline not in a giant way but modestly now new orders were the main culprit that slumped the most uh, hinting at weakening demand for factory goods and production remained in positive territory so it's really about that future activity, and obviously that's uh, a most important. Industrial earnings for this quarter have been continually uh, readjusted lower. And so you can see uh, this is why, because the ISM number uh, continues to to head above uh, below 50. The price index that did continue to expand above 50, but at a slower rate. So. That was the main economic news for today and certainly a mixed market overall. Uh, I still think we are in going into a choppy period. You know, we are, we're very overbought going into the month of uh, May, uh, sorry, month of April. And we haven't gone a whole, we've gone very far, right? The market peaked out in early May around 52.50 and now we're at 52.83. So it's been quite the choppy market. And that's to be expected. You know, that's what happens in markets. They rally, they have big moves, and then they shake a lot of people out, uh, get people to worry about a major market reversal. And that's certainly possible. But the earnings report for the Q1 were pretty good. 5.9%, I think it was, uh, year over year. The strongest growth, strong, strongest growth since first quarter of 2022. And earnings for this quarter continue to be upgraded, which is fairly rare. Post earnings, you typically get a readjustment lower, but that's the opposite, um, and especially led by energy. So that's the market right now. Uh, pretty much a flat day, I would say, overall. And uh, a flat market I'm expecting for the near term. 
Now we're taking a break for our radio affiliate, and I've got another Steve call lined up, so hang on. This is Invest Talk. The stock market is constantly changing, and serious investors want a way to get the latest news and unbiased investment insights. Welcome to the Invest Talk Podcast. Do you want to take your investment strategy to the next level? We invite you to visit investtalk.com and submit your portfolio for a free review from us. This is a fantastic opportunity to receive personalized advice and insights to enhance your results. Don't let this chance slip by. Go to investtalk.com, submit your portfolio, and let us help you on your journey towards greater investment success. We're going to head up to Northern California and talk to Eric, and he wants to talk about Steve. Eric, how do you remember Steve? Hey, Justin. Um, I remember Steve. I started my investing journey in 2019, and he was actually the first podcast that I ever listened to, wow. and I listened to him ever since, and you as well. So I just want to offer my condolences. Um, I even remember emailing you and Steve, and you guys would always get back to me within the week. Steve would respond no problem. He even sent me free newsletters because I was curious about it. So just want to know that um, he will be remembered. And my investing style is actually, um, you know, from a lot of advice that he's given. So just wanted to say that and um, give my condolences to the Invest Talk family. Thank you, Eric. I appreciate that. And I'm glad uh, he was able to help you like so many others and, and, and touch you in that way. And hopefully, uh, your those lessons uh, you can take with you and um, apply them daily, just like we do. Yeah, and thank you to uh, you and Luke as well for keeping it going. I know you guys are working hard and deserve a break, so appreciate you guys. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Now let's play another Steve question now. Let's go to Carl in Ohio. Carl. Hey, Steve. Uh, love the show. Listen to the podcast every day. Thank you. I got a question. I finally... Uh, built my brokerage account up enough to potentially pay off a 7% student loan. Would yeah. you advise taking the guaranteed 7% from the loan or with as uh, lucrative as the market has been, would you recommend staying in it? I think the market's going to do pretty well this year, 2021. But if you're going to give me a choice of I can not pay 7%, can I earn 7% in the market? Probably, but I'm going to have to take risks to earn that 7%. Paying off a loan at 7% is no risk. So if you're going to, if you give me the choice one or the other, I'd probably pay off the loan. All right, now, thank you. You know, I could be totally wrong. It might have been better to stay in the market, but I like that guarantee 7% I don't have to pay. If I don't have to pay it, it's like I earn it. I earn 7% because I don't have to pay it. So that's what I would do because I'm kind of conservative on that and that kind of thing. Carl, good luck with it. I hope it hope it works for you. And you know, like Steve said, he was pretty conservative, and we still get that question today. Now we both answer differently. If that caller would have said three percent, like a lot of people have locked in with mortgages today, but seven percent, you know, it's a that's that a guaranteed rate right now. You only get five percent on a. 10 year treasury and you're taking duration risk there, right? Short term treasuries, you're only getting, you know, five and a quarter. Not much risk, but still lower than that 7%. So uh, it makes sense. And uh, that was a good example of why Steve's sage wisdom still resonates today. Now let's play another call that came in earlier to Steve. Hello, my name is Hugh. And I'm 23 years old. I was wondering what I should be focusing on as someone that's new to investing. Thank you. Okay. You probably shouldn't be focusing on individual stocks because you're new. You probably want to focus on buying ETFs of indexes, the S&P 500, the NASDAQ, the Dow, the Russell 2000, buying an index until your knowledge grows. And then you can start buying individual stocks. But if you're new and you're just not 
you know, you just don't have the knowledge yet, don't try to buy individual stocks. It's, it's much more difficult than you might realize. Stick with the indexes. That's what I would suggest. Now, that was actually one of those topics that Steve and I slightly differed our opinion on. And Steve would even say that that's okay. It's, it, it's, it's never good to have uh, see eye to eye on everything because you're probably going to miss something and you're not thinking about the other side of every argument. Now, let me give you some color to that. And really, it depends on the investor's goals. I think new investors, they should probably actually, if they want to learn how to invest in individual stocks, I think doing it early is better. Because you don't have a lot of money. If you make a mistake, uh, you only lose a small amount. As opposed to if you start off with ETFs, you start off with those index funds, and then you grow it over time to hundreds of thousands of dollars, and then you start investing in individual stocks. Well, you might learn the hard way with you know, six figures versus maybe four figures, right? And so it depends on the goal of your investment journey. Now, for new investors, yeah, their their risk is going to be lower. And I think that's probably why Steve believed that, right? He was a little more conservative. And you don't want people to make mistakes, which you know, they often do the first the uh, first time out. So it just depends on on the longer term goals of your investment journey. But that was Steve's take. Now the next call to Steve. It will be a long question, so we'll take we'll get to that after the break. But this is a special Invest Talk podcast. A salute to Steve Peasley. Hey, welcome to Invest Talk. I'm Justin, and I'm Luke. Together, we're here to guide you through the maze of investing and give you insights that impact your portfolio. Whether you're a seasoned veteran or just getting started, we've got you covered with the latest trends, opportunities, and expert advice. We take your calls every weekday at 4 p.m. Pacific and anytime on our Invest Talk listener line. Just call 888 99Chart. We'll bring you deep dives into market analysis and answer your burning questions. So, why join us? To get ahead in your investment journey with strategies, tips, and knowledge that can unlock the full potential of your hard-earned money. But first, hit subscribe, turn your notifications on, and let's start making informed investment decisions together. Welcome Welcome to to InvestTalk. Let's go to Matt in Cupertino. How you doing, Matt? Uh, Thanks for taking my call. A quick question for you is curious in your opinion versus mutual bond funds or individual bond ladders. I would rather see you buy a ladder of individual bonds than bond funds. Mm-hmm. You know why? You tell me. Okay. <laughs> That's why I'm calling. Okay. <laughs> bond funds now, you got to remember what a bond fund does. It buys a bunch of bonds. So you get nice diversification. That's a big plus, okay? Mm-hmm. But the net asset value of that bond fund will go up and down depending on interest rates, okay? Mm -hmm. So if interest rates are moving up and you have a bond fund, the net asset value of that fund will go down. You'll still get your yield, in other words, the dividends that are coming in through those bonds. You'll still get those. But if your yield is 5% and the bond fund net asset value goes down 5%, you're no further along. If you buy the bonds direct and you buy a good spread of very safe bonds, I'm not interested in high-risk stuff. Me we're, ta- neither. we're talking about very safe stuff. If you buy them and hold them to maturity, they also will go up and down in value, but you will always get your money back plus the yield if you hold them to maturity. Whereas in a bond fund, that doesn't happen. Even though they may hold them to maturity, but the bond fund value goes up and down based on the interest rates. So you can buy a personal bond and you can buy it and hold it, and it will go up and down in value, but if you hold it to maturity, you'll get that money back. That's not necessarily so in a bond fund. That makes total sense. You saved me a few hours. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Matt, I appreciate it. I like bonds. I'm not opposed to them, but right now I'd keep them short duration. Like you know, one to five the, or how short? Five years or less. Perfect. Okay. okay. Thanks for your time. Thanks, Matt. I appreciate the call. We have a program that does buy bonds. We hold in maturity. 
inside there. So we know that they'll go up and down in value, but we'll get the yield and they'll go back to their par value when they mature so that you don't have that huge risk of a bond fund that will go up and down. Now, that was an example of Steve's ability to simplify a topic that confuses a lot of investors. And Steve was certainly great at that. Um, a bit more context to that call as well is that if there is a, a bond fund, a lot of times what happens is when it does go down, right? He talked about interest rates going up, the bond bonds inside that fund go down, the fund value goes down. And then if the other investors go and sell that bond fund, then the managers have to have to sell those bonds at a loss and lock in those losses. And so when interest rates maybe drop again, or just time goes by and the bonds go back to a uh, par, you don't get that appreciation. And so that's why you can have permanent loss of capital in bond funds, especially those long duration bond funds. And as Steve said, shorter duration is certainly better, especially right now. Now, the next question was on a topic that both Steve and I get quite a bit. So let's play the recorded call and listen to Steve's answer when someone asks about buying a house. Hey, guys, I'm looking to buy a house in the next six to nine months. So I'm trying to decide where to keep my down payment money. I have about $16,000. So I was wondering, should I keep it in savings or is an ETF a good idea? I look forward to hearing your advice. Thanks. Bye-bye. No, an ETF is not a good idea. Moving the money into the stock market is not a good idea if you're looking six to nine months down the road. Because who knows? You could be needing that money right when the market corrects. And so you lose 20%, 15% of that money when you need it for the down payment. So I would suggest you leave it in the savings account. If you had years, three, four, five years, then yeah, I would put it in the market. But not, not if you're going to need it in a short period of time, within a year. No. Um, even two years is probably too short. So leave it in the money market be, um, and you're just going to have to be unhappy with the returns because you're not going to get anything. Now, luckily today you earn a little bit, uh, on, on your cash and some ETFs can act like cash or our money market funds. There are some of those out there. So he was speaking generally about ETFs that most of them are equities and that's how most people view them. Um, and that's certainly uh, true. Now, Steve had a ton of experience in real estate. He uh, developed a bunch of uh, a, a track of homes uh, in San Diego uh, when he was younger. And he taught me a lot of lessons about real estate and uh, tenants, how to deal with tenants and uh, good things and bad things and what to look for uh, for tenants. Uh, he sold a little bit too early before the uh, housing bust. He sold in 04, right? Peaked in 05, 06. So he did sell a little bit early, but had a ton of experience in real estate. And I learned uh, so much from him. And, you know, I know you guys did a, a, as well throughout the years. And buying a house is certainly a a big uh, ask, a big uh, step for, for most people. And it's important to get it right. And so he helped a lot of people throughout the years through that process of what to look out for. Uh, and usually he said to go for it. Now, we have a fairly large and loyal Investoc audience in the San Francisco Bay Area. So let's play another Steve Peasley call and answer that now. Let's go to JP in San Francisco. How are you doing, JP? Hey, I got a question. You know how uh, whenever you talk to a finance radio talk show, uh -huh. they always uh, talk about how analysts is like they're just pumping up stocks. They're usually wrong. So, I mean, they're not always wrong, but they're usually wrong. But majority of the time they're wrong. Right. I would say more than 50%. So what about using as a strategy, just going opposite what they always talk about? <laughs> yeah, that might be a good strategy. I've never never thought about that. <laughs> what I have noticed is what happens is they are they're usually wrong. It's the degree of how wrong they're going to be. Someone did a study, I read this a few months back, from the very initial looking at a stock. In other words, let's say eBay came out with earnings tonight, and now the analysts are going to be predicting what they're going to do next quarter. From this point right now, they're usually off, according to this article, about 40, 40%. Wow. But what they do is they keep changing their numbers as the quarter goes by. So even at the very end, they're still wrong. They're just not as wrong as they were before. Now, that could be wrong high or low. You never know how what side of the coin they're going to be wrong on. Oh. So that's the problem. That's interesting. All right. Good enough. Thank okay. you. Thank you. 
I love that call uh, because he highlights statistics and he was, he loves statistics and uh, you might not, you might have known this if you went to some of the in-person conferences throughout the years, but he loved quizzing people and he would usually have two or three statistics that he would quiz the audience before each conference and usually very thought provoking ones. And he would do that in office as well. He would come out of his office and say, you know, and, and, and ask the, the, the group what they thought the answer was to this particular uh, statistic. And it was usually pretty enlightening and, and, uh, and, and he definitely loved that. And, uh, you know, even in his book, it, he talks about analysts and uh, those price targets and things like that. And, you know, he saw throughout the years how often wrong they were. Uh, they were often prisoners of the moment. And their price targets didn't really have any real predictive power. Uh, and so they said, don't buy just because an analyst says buy or sell. Um, because so many other factors are more important that they're not considering. They're just using what their expectations for earnings are, which are tend to be good, but then they slap multiple on it, which may be correct, may be incorrect. Uh, and multiples in the market in that particular sector can move, uh, et cetera. And so, you know, he was not a big fan of analysts on the street giving price targets because he knew they were often very, very wrong. Now, there are many, Steve, topics and answers to choose from, and we have hundreds saved in our voice bank. And let's play one more now. Hi, this is Duncan from New York. This is my, I think, third question. And for anybody that's listening, these guys do a great job responding within a couple of days. My question is, you keep on mentioning about pullbacks. What exactly do you mean by pullbacks? For example, what type of percentage are you looking for for small cap, for mid cap, and for large cap? And hopefully, if you guys have time, exactly what is a good P.E. ratio that we should look for when we are thinking about investing in the stock? Thank you very much, and have a great day. Bye. Well, those are pretty difficult questions there, to be honest. Um, a pullback of the S&P 500 of 10% is normal. Okay, now for a small cap, usually it's a bigger percentage. For large cap, I mean the big blue chip stocks, usually it's a smaller percentage. But a pullback would be normally ten percent, but you can have them five percent. You can have them twenty percent. Anything over twenty percent is called a bear market. So that's what a pullbacks mean. That was a good explanation of normal market volatility and. You know, markets are, are cyclical and every stock and, and index has its own cycle. And, you know, it was very correct that there's no standard definition of what a pullback should be in, in any particular name. Uh, the riskier the stock, the, the bigger the pullback, a, a healthy pullback. When we say pullback, that's healthy. That's the market working off excess bullishness. And that's a buying opportunity typically. And a 5% drop can be a pullback in one company uh, versus 5% pullback in another one could be just normal daily, weekly market gyrations. And so it's definitely important to understand it in context. And then when he asked about P ratio, I know Steve didn't get to that, but it's really about the growth of the company, the sector that it's trading in, the cyclicality of its business, the steadiness of its business. And so there's no right P ratio that applies to every company. You can have a, an expensive company trading at a 10 P ratio. Or you can have a cheap company trading at a 25 P ratio. It all depends on once again, the quality of their business, the growth rate, the stability of that business, et cetera. So it's, uh, I, I, I love that call as well, uh, in order to, you know, give investors context because, uh, there is no hard and fast rule. There isn't, I know everyone wants a simple cookie cutter. You do this and that's it. Well, depends on what you're talking about. 
depends on the asset you're talking about. Okay. Now, I did want to pivot over to a recent story, and this is something that Steve would love to cover. And that is a recent, uh, looks like lawsuit. Now, it's, it's still under investigation. Uh, and this is in regards to the pickleball industry. You know, pickleball is the hot, hot thing now. And there's a guy named Rodney Grubbs, and he started a merchandise company called Pickleball Rocks, and it's the world's most recognized pickleball apparel brand. However, this is a man who throughout the last couple decades, it looks like, has bar as, as quote unquote invested people's money and offered 12% interest rate over 18 months. And to invest in real estate projects and, 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 and different, um, different quote unquote investments. But a recent court filing says that he now owes a total of $47.5 million, including interest, and that the money has largely vanished. Now, sometimes he would pay the money back, but oftentimes, eventually, he wouldn't pay it all back. And most of this, most of this is uh, involving the older generation. In fact, the reigning senior national pickleball champion and tons of retirees, even a priest, are now caught up in this. And he owes money to over 500 different creditors, spanning 30 states and several countries. And the investigation remains open. He's now in bankruptcy. He's closed his uh, pickleball rock store, stopped going to tournaments. That's what he did. He, he, he used to pal around in different tournaments, uh, pickleball tournaments throughout the country and sell his wares and make friends. And apparently he was a very gregarious, confident, <clears throat> charismatic guy. And he, he duped a lot of people. And this is your classic affinity scam. scam. And Steve talked about this all the time and would implore people to avoid giving money to uh, lending money, finding investments that were not regulated, that were outside the standard zone of investing. Because he saw this time after time after time. He even had a, uh, and he learned this the hard way in his younger years when he was a, uh, he was a entrepreneur. He had a business and he's trying to avoid taxes. And there was a investment that would help him, you know, avoid taxes. And it was in some sort of development in I think New Jersey. And the money disappeared. The mob basically stole it. And he he even he did his due diligence back then. He went out, he looked at the the them building the the building, et cetera, and it was still stolen from him. And so this is a perfect example of how it's very easy to get duped in by fast talkers and people that you feel are like you. And just because it feels good doesn't mean you skip the due diligence process, especially when there's no regulatory body looking over that particular type of investment. So very interesting story and something Steve would often cover. Now, as we go to the break, I want to remind you that the KPP Financial Invest Talk Wealth Webinar is coming up, hosted by myself and Luke Guerrero. And the title is Quality Investing, Digging Deeper Than Dividends. It all happens online next Tuesday, June 11th. So a little over a week from now, from 1 to 2 p.m. Pacific time, just head over to investtalk.com to register for our upcoming wealth webinar. It's free. But once again, you must register. Now, the phone lines are open, waiting for your calls at 888-99-CHART. Mm-hmm. 
The big day is coming up fast. Click the link in this video to register for the new InvestTalk Wealth Webinar. It's all happening online Tuesday, June 11th at 1 p.m. Pacific Time. You are invited to join KPP Financial's InvestTalk hosts, Justin Klein and Luke Guerrero, as they reveal the secrets of quality investing. Learn why it's essential to look beyond high dividend yield so you can build a resilient and profitable portfolio. In today's volatile market, quality investing is the key to long-term success. Justin and Luke will provide insights and strategies to help you make informed investment decisions. Reserve your spot now. Click the link in this video to register for the new InvestTalk Wealth Webinar. Now, as we close today, I want to say a few more words about Steve, give you, you know, some, some background of, of his life, uh, because, uh, he definitely deserves to be remembered. Uh, you know, like I said, at the top of the show, he grew up poor and he actually moved out when he was 17 years old. His, uh, brother stole some stuff from him and he decided to move out. His mom didn't do anything about it. And so he decided to buy a van and lived in a van, lived in a van through college, studied ur urban planning, but didn't work out. Went to Cal Poly Pomona and he graduated into a bad economy and decided to, the only one, only industry he was hiring was insurance. Ended up moving to New York city uh, and I, those are the stories I'll probably miss the most are uh, his stories of walking the streets of New York City in the 70s. As you would imagine, there's probably a uh, uh, there, there were a lot of uh, shady things that went down. And he would tell me about them going to different shops owned by probably mafia and them trying to pay him off in certain ways to uh, avoid avoid being caught by, you know, the insurance company committing insurance fraud. And he was a man of integrity. And uh, he would tell me stories about how he would go back to his bosses and, and, and tell them. And they wouldn't even do anything about it. But still, he was a man of integrity. And the fact that he moved out and was able to basically bootstrap his way to a very successful career is a testament to the man he was. He persevered. And most importantly, he took those lessons and he imparted that advice on, I know myself and the rest of you. And so he will be sorely missed. And I know that, uh, you know, in, in lieu of flowers, um, we are setting up a, uh, a donation link to um, a, a company or not company, a uh, nonprofit that is all about financial literacy, especially those that are underserved, that come from a background like Steve's and to help them understand it's called operation hope, help them understand how to manage their money correctly and achieve financial freedom, which Steve ultimately did. And he did that in his forties. Like I said, he did this because he loved it. He didn't really love insurance. He just knew it because he had experience in it, but he retired in his mid forties. He realized, you know, I don't want to garden every day. He liked gardening. And my grandfather, like I said, at the top of the show was his advisor. And he came and he donated his time just to learn from my grandfather and how to do it even better than he did. Cause he did it well, but my grandfather did it even better. And that was what started his journey on InvestTalk, on KPP. 
And he definitely made the most of it. So I want to close with just saying that, Steve, we love you. We always remember you. I will carry these lessons with me, and I know our listeners will for the rest of their lives. And we miss you already. And thank you all for your kind words during this time. And with that said, I know Steve would say, go on, push forward and keep learning together and keep being successful together. I'm Justin Klein. It's a very special Invest Talk program. A salute to Steve Peasley. We thank you for listening. We encourage you to tell your friends and family about our free podcast downloads, which you can find anytime at iTunes, Spotify, or Google Play. Independent thinking, shared success. This is Invest Talk. Good night. Hey everyone, if you enjoyed this video and want to see more amazing content, make sure you hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications. Your support means the world to us and helps us create more videos that you love. Subscribe now and join our community of savvy investors.